So this video is actually part of two different playlists. So you might have gotten to this video after watching the first video talking about how to conduct and interpret a Pearson correlation using SPSS, that this video is actually also part of my stats class, chapter 15 lecture notes. It would be part three in the chapter lecture notes. Either way, I ended the last video on identifying the critical value for our Pearson correlation using the table. So let's talk about what our, um, our distribution looks like. So this is the distribution for all of the possible values that we could get for our correlation. So these are all of the possible R values that we can get when we're measuring a correlation. So we're always testing our hypothesis against the null hypothesis. And recall that the null hypothesis is going to be what's at the center of our distribution. So according to the null hypothesis, there should be no correlation. So that value is going to be zero in the middle. And we just looked up our critical values of R and found them to be uh, 0.361. So this is, this is a two-tailed test. So that means that we could have either a positive 0.361 or bigger than that, or we would also draw a line here at the negative 0.361. And then we're shading in the critical regions, which are all of those correlation values that are more extreme than that value that we looked up. So essentially what that means is that our correlation needs to be um, more extreme than negative 0.361, or it needs to be more extreme than positive 0.361 in order for us to say that this correlation is significant. So if after measuring our correlation, we find it to be more extreme than any of those two values, then that would be a significant correlation. So let's look back at our actual data from SPSS to actually see what the value of R or what the correlational value was. So SPSS gives you the value of your correlation in your output. Um, rather than labeling it as R, it just labels it as Pearson correlation. But remember that Pearson correlation, it is your value for R. So it just labels R as Pearson correlation in the table here. So that is your R, whatever the Pearson correlation is. So make sure again that you're looking at the right um, cell here. So you want to make sure you're looking for the combination of your two variables. So we're looking at the combination of the number of drinks consumed and the number of people flirted with. Again, it gives you the information twice, which is really unnecessary, but that's what it does. So we're going to look for the combination of those two variables, and we're going to look in this row representing the Pearson correlation. So this is our value of R. So that is our actual calculated value for the Pearson correlation is going to be 0.546. So we'll add that into our step three. That is our value of R that was calculated. And that is the primary goal of step three is to identify what your correlation value is from your data set. Just as within any other hypothesis test procedure, we're going to take this value that we've calculated in step three and compare it to the criteria that we established in step two. So let's look back to the criteria that we established in step two to see where our critical region is and identify whether this value falls within our critical region or not. So here in step two, we established our distribution and had shaded in all of the areas that were contained within the critical region. And we identify that our value that we calculated in step three was 0.546, which indeed falls within the critical region as that value of 0.546 is more extreme or it's larger than the critical region where we set it up. That line was drawn at 0.361 our value is bigger than that. So it is falling within our critical region. Since our obtained value, our calculated value for R does fall in the critical region, that means that our decision will be 
to reject the null hypothesis. So the null hypothesis was wrong. There actually is a correlation between these variables. So the way we would write up our conclusion is to state just that. So we would say something like, uh, there is a significant positive association. So again, in, in place of that word association, you could say a positive relationship, positive correlation, or positive association. But do make sure you use one of those three words to indicate that it's a correlation. But we would say something like that, significant positive because it's a positive number. So it's a positive correlation. And it's a positive association between these two variables, the number of drinks consumed and the number of people flirted with. And then after that, we want to report our statistics that we use to make that decision. So the Pearson correlation uses the R statistic. And then in parentheses next to it, you can actually do one of two things. You can either put the degrees of freedom or you could put N is equal to and then you can report what the N was. So our N was 30. Either of those two approaches is actually okay. But I just went the degrees of freedom route and we talked about degrees of freedom in step two. So I'm not gonna cover that again. But there's our degrees of freedom in our parentheses and we found our calculated value for R was 0.55. So I just rounded the number to be two numbers after the decimal point. So that's why it's 0.55 rather than 0.546 is due to rounding. And then you'll see that I reported the actual p-value. So again, SPSS, it calls our p-value sig for some reason, but that value for sig, again, we're still using this set of um, cells right here. So our sig value is our p-value, which is 0.002. So we can just report that full number right there as our p-value. And then uh, at the end of it, you don't have to do this, but if you're asked to report a measure of effect size, you can report r squared, which yes, is just literally your r value squared. So if you take your value for r and square it, that is your value for r squared, um, which is a measure of effect size. So it's a little redundant in the correlation, which is why sometimes it's it's not reported um, since people have access to your R value right there. Um, but if you're asked to report a measure of effect size, you can report R squared by just squaring your value for the Pearson correlation. So there also is the same type of shortcut that remains here um, that is always gonna exist for other tests in SPSS. We actually can figure out the decision of our hypothesis test by just looking at that sig or looking at that p-value. So as with every other test in SPSS, if this value, if our sig value is less than our alpha level, that means that we reject the null hypothesis and either the difference is significant, the relationship is significant, whatever you're testing is significant anytime that sig value is less than your alpha level. That's just a shortcut in order to um, to test your hypotheses as well. You can just look at that sig value, compare it to your alpha level, and that tells you what decision you can make. So that's how you do the hypothesis test using the Pearson correlation. I just wanted to briefly discuss some other types of correlations that you can use. Um, so other than the Pearson correlation, there are other types of correlations that allow you to look at the relationship between two variables um, that are not both on interval ratio measures, um, scales of measurement. So the Spearling, Spearman correlation is used when you have an ordinal scale of measurement. So if you have an ordinal scale of measurement, so like small, medium, and large, um, you can use the Spearman correlation in place of the Pearson correlation, and that can tell you the relationship between two, two ordinal scales of measurement. There's also the point by serial correlation, which involves looking at the correlation between two variables, one of which is measured on an interval or ratio scale, and then the other one is a di dichotomous variable. A dichotomous variable is just a variable that has two options, so like yes or no. 
Um, so the point by serial correlation will look at the correlation between variables of these two types. And then last but not least, we have the fee coefficient, which can be used to look at the correlation between two variables that are both measured on dichotomous scales. So two variables that have yes or no as an option. So let's say, do you have a job and are you a student? Both of those that response options would be yes or no. And so the fee coefficient could be used to look at the relationship between those two dichotomous variables. So those are just some other options for types of correlations that you can use um, for other types of scales of measurement. If your variables aren't both on ratio or interval scales of measurement, you could actually use some of these other types of correlations to test the relationship between two variables. So that's it. So hopefully now you understand everything about correlations. So please contact me if you have any questions and I will talk to you later. Bye.